Before we get started, I have a quick favor. I've been self-funding the Finding Genius podcast for five years now. I've done over 3,000 episodes. And as you can see on YouTube, we're up over a million views on the channel, which is fantastic. The next thing I really want to push on is to get up to 10,000 subscribers. Because once we do, we'll be able to put a donate button and uh, we'll be able to solicit donations to help keep the podcast running and to also get the Finding Genius Foundation moving along. We have a big project studying anxiety, depression, and PTSD and working on a product to help people overcome these problems because I've seen them explode recently after the, the last two years of the whole virus situation. So if you would, please subscribe to the podcast. That would help us tremendously give us a thumbs up and check in the description for buy me a coffee it's about five bucks if you could buy me a coffee i'd really appreciate it It would help keep the channel going and i love coffee thank you some of them do go into the sun and some of them will collide with planets and you know self-destruct but a lot of them just are happy orbiting around the sun and living their best life either in the cold far reaches of the solar system or in the case of asteroids happily in their asteroid belt sitting there getting a sunburn. Now that we've done that, now that we know that we can do that, now that we know what a common environment actually looks like and how it varies as it comes in and around the sun um, to the outer reaches of its orbit, we really want to go to a sample now, scoop up some of the dust off the surface, dust and ice, hopefully, and then bring that back to Earth so that we can study it in our laboratories. Forget frequently asked questions. Common sense, common knowledge, or Google. How about advice from a real genius? 95% of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed. 5% go above and beyond. They become very good at what they do, but only 0.1% are real geniuses. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius Podcast, now part of the Finding Genius Foundation. I have a really great guest, Stephanie Milam, PhD. She's a the James Webb Space Telescope Deputy Project Scientist uh, for Planetary Science at uh, the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. So we're going to talk about her work in uh, astrochemistry, of which she works in a lab there on that, and um, her other observations and other work. So, Stephanie, thanks for coming. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, tell me about uh, your work with, with NASA. What do you do there? What are some of the projects you're working on? Um, my primary goal at NASA is to study the chemistry of comets. So I observe comets both from our solar system and now interstellar objects uh, with ground and space-based telescopes. And we're trying to understand, you know, how, how pristine comets are. So whether or not they're really the true cookie crumbs left from when the planets formed in our solar system. Um, and, and or how much they, they were processed. So I also have a laboratory at Goddard where uh, we make a comet in the lab and we simulate that chemistry just for the, the help of analysis, interpretation, and understanding of the chemistry and physics that are happening in these, these beautiful objects as they're coming around the sun. And then okay. finally, and most importantly, I'm uh, working on the James Webb Space Telescope, as you said, um, as a deputy project scientist for planetary science, which means I'm making sure this huge astrophysics, extremely sensitive, hunting for the first stars and galaxies space telescope can also study things in our own solar system, which are really fast and really bright. Okay, well, I guess, yeah, if you're right, we'll divide between comets and James Webb. Talk about both of it, okay? Yeah. All right, so um, for comets, what's the difference between a comet and an asteroid? Mostly where they formed and where they live. So comets and asteroids are both considered relics of when our solar system was formed, when the planets were forming. And um, asteroids reside in the inner solar system or in the asteroid belt region. And they are close enough to the sun and have lived there long enough that they don't have a lot of the volatile component left within them. So it's mostly the, the rock and the dust from the formation of our solar system that's being preserved in asteroids. Whereas comets have a large component of the volatile stuff that from when the solar system formed. So a lot of ice 
as well as the dust and gas that was present when the solar system was being formed. And so we think there's a lot of interesting, you know, volatile material um, that's that's remnant from that whole process and trying to understand what that chemistry is, is what I do. So if if, uh, comets and asteroids are about the same age range, I mean, first of all, like, are all these objects a narrow range of age? Yeah. They would have formed when all the planets and sun were accreting, or they have like a wide, wide range of age. Yeah, um, that's that's a great question. We we do find extremely old pieces within asteroids and comets, so things that we call calcium aluminum inclusions. So these are extremely hot sort of things that happen as the solar system was forming. We also see in the comets, and this is probably the most interesting thing, at least in my perspective, some of the ice that we see, we actually think is pre-stellar disk. Um, We think that some of the material, some of that volatile gas and ice is actually from before the solar system formed. And that's what we're trying to figure out. So why are uh, asteroids, I I don't know if they're entirely or just mostly confined to like was it called the Kuiper Belt or the what's the belt between Mars and, and Jupiter? Is that where most of them hang out? The asteroid belt. Yes. The asteroid. I was just called the asteroid. Belt. Okay. I don't know if it had a, a name. But okay. yeah. Um. So why? What, what's the difference between those and comets? Why are comets uh, apparently more free range and moving around in, in you know much greater orbits, and the other asteroids are stuck in that one place? So comets come um, from mostly the Kuiper belt, as well as we have what we call new dynamic objects. So these are things that come from even beyond the Kuiper belt, so probably the Oort cloud. Um, And it's actually some of the only uh, real evidence that we have that there is an Oort cloud. Otherwise, it's just a a theory. But so uh, your question again, I believe, was um, why do we think comets? Go ahead. Yeah, like where do most comets move? Where do they go? And where do most asteroids go? Do they do asteroids tend to stay in a, a much smaller spot and stay in the asteroid belt versus comets that run all over the place? Or what's the reality? <laughs> comets running amok. Asteroids are they have they tend to have a little bit more stable orbits in that asteroid belt unless they collide with one another and get perturbed in some manner. Uh, we do have objects that come pretty close to the Earth, and we call those near-Earth asteroids. Whereas comets are coming from a bit further away. They have more eccentric orbits, uh, so they're getting perturbed from either collisions again in the outer solar system with one another or getting pulled by Jupiter, other gravitational effects from the planets. And so as their orbit comes, as they get pulled into the sun from their own gravitational attraction to the sun, that's where we see the, the activity of these objects, and sometimes they... They have a nice stable sort of what we'll call short period of an orbit. So every anywhere from every couple of years to a hundred years or so, if you want to think of like a comet Halley sort of scale, to objects that we've only seen once or twice, and we don't know if they'll come back. And some of them don't come back when we expect them to based on their orbit. And some of them are just so such a long orbit that you know we'll probably never see them in our lifetime, you know hundreds or tens of thousands of years as far as their orbit for when they come into the inner solar system. So it's always interesting. And then there's interstellar objects, which just fly through our solar system and we never get to see them again. (laughs) Yeah. From what I understand, I guess the sun makes up like what, like 99% of the mass of our solar system. And then Jupiter is like 85% of the mass of all the planets. Right. Right. Yeah. So all the other stuff is pretty small in comparison. <laughs> but that, so does that mean like a vast majority of asteroids and or comets will end up either going into the sun or going into Jupiter? Like where do they, what are the major sinks for these um, things that take them out of circulation? Some of them do go into the sun and some of them will collide with planets and, you know, self-destruct. But a lot of them just are happy orbiting around the sun and living their best life either in the cold far reaches of the solar system or in the case of asteroids happily in their asteroid belt sitting there getting a sunburn before we continue i've been personally funding the finding genius podcast for four and a half years now which has led to 2700 plus interviews of clinicians researchers scientists ceos and other amazing people who are working to advance science and improve our lives in our world even though this podcast gets 100,000 plus downloads a month 
We need your help to reach hundreds of thousands more worldwide. Please visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click on Support Us. We have three levels of membership from $10 to $49 a month, including perks such as the ability to see ahead in our interview calendar and ask questions of upcoming guests, transcripts of podcasts you're interested in, the ability to request specific topics or guests, and more. Visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click Support Us today. Now, back to the show. So why, um, why do we have this asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter? Why there? And why do objects tend to, to stay there? So the, of, the small bodies all got scattered um, whenever the giant planets were migrating. Um, and the reservoirs of where these small bodies are. And it, it's kind of funny because, you know, decades ago, we thought that there were very distinct reservoirs. And it seems now that we're finding more and more objects kind of breaching in between our main you know, known reservoirs, the, the Kuiper belt and the asteroid belt. So we're now finding objects that are kind of meshing in between and, and, and moving in between these two main reservoirs. It's all based on the dynamics of the planets, the mass of Jupiter um, versus the sun, and how when Jupiter was big, you know, pushed and pulled about as during the formation of our solar system, um, it was kind of kicking all these small bodies either into the inner solar system or out to the outer solar system. Well, I guess I would think like uh, Jupiter would be the, the biggest arbiter of the path of comets and, and asteroids because it's the greatest mass. And I guess it would have the greatest gravitational well. The sun, obviously, is far more, but um, right, right. Jupiter act to deflect comets or asteroids hitting us. Um, like what's, what do you see as the role of Jupiter in the solar system versus the sun? Um, absolutely. It can it can deflect or um, pull them into new orbits. So we do have like comets that are mostly in a in a beautiful orbit between the sun and Jupiter, Jupiter sort of area. And we call those Jupiter family comets. Um, so they they tend to have a lot shorter periods and they're sort of um, under the guise and, um, you know, survey or surveillance of Jupiter and its system. So it's they're they're definitely more bound to that massive planet um, dynamic. And then um, the structure of asteroids versus comets, like from the outside in, how different are they and what's different about them? Um, we're just sort of starting to skim the surface of this. So with flyby missions and sample return and, you know, the DART impact mission, we're trying to understand how these bodies actually, you know, how they're formed, but also what what they're made of. So are are they mostly a, a series or a rubble pile of rocks in the case of asteroids versus large solid boulders versus, the, you know, comets being these dusty ice balls or icy dirt balls, however you want to think of it, um, as we've imaged now a number of comets and orbited them and, and been able to get closer to, to more and more of these objects. They seem to have this bilobe sort of structures and it's led a lot to, of thought and, you know, studies on how maybe it's um, two smaller components that have fused together during an impact or a collision. So understanding what that dynamic would look like why they didn't destroy one another and why they seem to just fuse together. Is this a process that is happening routinely to make bigger and bigger bodies in our solar system? Or is it a destructive mechanism? Or is there something that's eating away material in, in various ways to make them look like a bilobe or, you know, a fused together two component system? So mm -hmm. there's a lot of, a lot of questions we're, we're trying to answer. And, you know, the more, we have opportunities to, to image these things, to sample these things, or even with new things that we're doing, like impacting them. It's teaching us a lot about what they actually are made of and comprised of and, and how that actually falls into place with the whole story of the formation of the planetesimals and how they, you know, aggregated into larger and larger bodies like the planets or moons in our solar system. Yeah, but how would comets exist for any length of time? I would think that, you know, space is a, most, well, it's a vacuum. I would think any water would vaporize off in like two seconds. So how could they exist for millions or billions of years? <laughs> they're, they're pretty big. And um, they sublimate a couple of, you know, if you want to think about the, the surface as they come around the sun, depending on how close they get to the sun now, 
obviously those that go through the, the photosphere are pretty much annihilated and completely sublimated into, into gas tufts or burst into the sun. Um, but those that just come pretty close, they do get pretty warm. And you have to remember these are these are larger large enough bodies that when they get that close to the sun they are sublimating a lot of their gas so the comets that come around more frequently tend to be less volatile rich so they don't have as much ice and gas as those that are brand new coming into the solar well we'll call them brand new new to us those that have really 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 long periods they tend to be much more volatile rich because they've just sat there sort of in the back of the freezer with your steak from five years ago just being preserved and in a nice cold sort of region where they're not being affected by too much of the solar radiation and a little bit of the radiation from, you know, beyond our solar system, but not a whole lot. There is, it's a pretty dark and, and cold area of, that protects them. So they're nice and preserved. And it's, it's always interesting to see how active the new ones are going to be compared to those that are coming around more frequently. Right. What, what happens uh, when a comet enters Earth's atmosphere? Does it literally vaporize to like uh, just its hard core? Or like what happens to them versus asteroids that are more rock or more metal? So there is a lot of rock, actually, in comets. Um, we just don't know how much. We don't know what that looks like on the inside. We don't know if they have little pockets of ice or whether or not it's sort of an asteroid with the icy matrix kind of in between it, right? We're learning more and more, again, with each mission that we have. So... If an icy body like a comet was coming into Earth's atmosphere, a lot of it's actually going to, to sublimate dur during the entry phase of the Earth, right? So, I mean, we see this all the time with, with other things that just burn up in the upper atmosphere as they come in. There's a lot of energy with, you know, coming into the, into the planetary atmosphere, but also then the dynamic of that body going through the atmosphere. It's a, a lot of surface pressure. So all of that heat is actually going to sublimate a lot of the volatile material pretty quickly. And then whatever the the dust and boulder or rock sort of component will then obviously persist as long as they can. Who knows if, if it's a large enough body, there will probably be a pretty significant impact, something sort of dinosaur killing um, type of level. But if it's a smaller object and more ice than dust, then perhaps a lot of that will be destroyed in the upper atmosphere and sort of void, I guess, um, before it reaches the Earth. Or the stuff that does reach the Earth would probably be a lot smaller. Well, are there any known instances of meteorites that were comets when they entered the Earth's atmosphere that people have found <laughs> and, and analyzed? Not, not that we are aware of, um, but we do, I mean, when we go through, so the... The meteor showers that we observe, these are basically dust tails and trails of comets that we know. So every time a comet goes around the sun, it, it loses some of its gas and its dust, and that's what makes a beautiful comet in the sky. Um, but those that go around very periodically, we see their dust trails. They, it's like a, a snail or a slug leaving its trail behind it. And whenever the earth passes through those trails is what creates these beautiful meteor showers for us. And sometimes those particles will fall to the ground, um, but they're usually so fine and small that they never actually reach the ground. And so I don't know that there's a confirmed cometary meteorite that's ever been, you know, found or confirmed. There may be some. I don't know of any off the top of my head. <laughs> that's interesting. So no one's ever confirmed that. I mean, if it happened, if, I mean, is it a certainty that it's happened? We just don't know it? Like, um, again, if a meteorite is found, would we know that it was even a comet or comet-like, or could we tell? That's, that's a really interesting question. Um, the, so far, the samples that we've returned from a comet were from the Stardust mission, and they looked very similar, um, you know, very heavy in weight. Difference between the cometary material versus meteoritic material, material or other asteroid material that we've now brought back. There wasn't too much variation. The, some of the atomic abundances are slightly different, but the statistics are so low. We've, we've only collected samples from one comet. It was done in a way that only the, the strongest, hardiest particles were the ones that actually survived in, in the Stardust mission during capture and collection. 
So bringing back a, a more pristine sample from the surface of a comet would probably be a lot more insight into you know, what that would actually look like and how we could compare a meteorite that, that was retrieved. Are there any comets with uh, stable enough orbits that we could roll up alongside them or get closer with a craft or even land on them? Or is that like craziness for decades from now, maybe? <laughs> <laughs> there are lots, and we are trying. Um, the Rosetta mission, though, is a perfect demonstration of what we can do. Um, so the European Space Agency had a mission to a comet that, that comes around the sun every six, seven years. And so it was easy to get to that comet. I, I mean, I say easy, of course, but it had a nice stable orbit and it was something that was easy to approach such that they, they actually got to the comet and they followed it around the sun and orbited this comet for a number of years um, before finally crashing the spacecraft into the comet's surface. Um, so it was a really spectacular event. What we want though now, now that we've done that, now that we know that we can do that, now that we know what a common environment actually looks like and how it varies as it comes in and around the sun um, to, to the outer reaches of its orbit, we really want to go to a sample now, scoop up some of the dust off the surface, dust and ice, hopefully, and then bring that back to Earth so that we can study it in our laboratories. Has, has anyone found um, void spaces in meteorites that have landed? And been able to sample like what's in the void spaces any gases or anything or does that not happen i i don't think so i would imagine any like gas pockets would heat up enough at, during entry that it would probably cause the the object to fragment so i don't know that there's been gas voids that have been studied in that sort of level but that's an interesting question yeah <laughs> are there um are there any like you know i, I read about it, Moa, Moa, you know couple of years ago, I guess it came from outside the solar system. Are there comets that come from outside the solar system that we can tell, or we don't know? Yeah, absolutely. So we now have two interstellar objects that have been identified. So Oumuamua, which was the sort of cigar-shaped, asteroidal-looking object. And then the second one actually came um, a number of months later and was identified and confirmed to be an interstellar object, but it looked like a comet. It was called Borzov. Um, and it was very cometary looking. It, it was fuzzy. It had a beautiful tail. And we were able to detect the volatile signature coming from that. Quick as they move and as challenging as they are to observe, because um, upon discovery to the time you can actually observe them, is a pretty quick turnaround time for an interstellar object, at least the two that we now have had and known. So it was hard to get a real handle on the inventory of the volatile component of that interstellar comet, but it looked mostly like a comet that we see in our solar system, except for some of the abundances of the volatile material were very extreme. So we found a lot of carbon monoxide, for example, in, in this interstellar comet compared to what we typically see in comets from our solar system. Um, and not as much water. So it was it was interesting, and it seemed to change on a, a pretty dynamic uh, time scale, such that you know we could actually see the variation in the the different molecules changing you know from one month to another. Um, sometimes we see this in our own comets when there's an outburst event or something. If it has a, a unique spin that you know one side of the comet actually gets hotter for a while, you might have some different outgassing that happens. But it was a really interesting object. And, you know, we have a sample of one interstellar asteroid now and one interstellar comet now. So hopefully we get more, you know, with new upcoming surveys and we can start getting some inventory and, and statistics on these objects to understand, you know, what an interstellar comet versus an interstellar asteroid really means. Yeah, and, and can we tell how old comets or asteroids are? Or they have to be meteorites and we have to, like, grab them and sample them that way in order to know um that's a good question we i mean we believe that they're as old as the solar system and we have reasons to believe that just being pristine remnant objects sort of like i said the cookie crumbs of the planets that had formed what i was alluding to earlier with uh comets might have some component that's even older that's based on the isotope ratios that we can measure the volatile isotope ratios so nitrogen, for example, is pretty heavy in comets. Um, the nitrogen-15 isotope is, is pretty abundant compared to the Earth or the Sun. 
And the only other environment that we see nitrogen enrichment in that manner is actually in really cold star forming regions where you can enhance that chemistry quite, quite significantly to get heavy nitrogen. So that, that is a, an interesting question to us to understand how old comets actually are and whether or not some of their material, maybe not all of it, but maybe some of it is actually pre-stellar. Yeah, what, what are the oldest ones? Do we, do we have any idea? Or again, it's just, it's just a big guess. And we really, like, right now it's a know, guess, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, what about, guess. can we extrapolate from meteorites? Like, I don't know how many meteorites have been characterized on Earth. Hopefully oh, an appreciable yeah. number, but, oh, good. But, what, like, what are their age ranges then? Like, where um, do see so, uh, meteorites are, are you know, um, s solar system sort of level. But we do see extremely old, or we see star dust <laughs> in some of these meteorites. So, they'll, they'll see actual evidence of something that came from a supernova, for example. So, there's extreme grains that we can actually see that, that came from you know, a nearby supernova event that perhaps was, you know, shedding some of its dust into our solar system when the, when the solar system was forming. Um, and we believe that on multiple levels, um, seeing some, some enrichments and, and processes that, that, have, that have been found now in, in not only the meteoritic record, but there's other evidence for, for supernova enrichment as well. So it's interesting to think I mean, you know, there's a saying, you know, that we're made of stars, and it's true. Every component, every element beyond hydrogen and helium, you know, is something that is formed in a star and has been processed and recirculated and regurgitated um, through the star formation history of our universe. But it's the nature of, you know, how much of that material is actually preserved from one phase to the next of star formation, star and planet formation, as well as evolution. Um, that's, that's really curious, and the fact that we can see these supernova, you know, components, atomic level components in, in meteorites is really interesting and very compelling. I don't know if this is a ridiculous idea, but has anyone tried to make a man-made, you know, it would obviously be a tiny asteroid that would be, you know, brought up into Earth orbit and then spat out into space with a tracking device on it to see, like, where it goes and how it interacts? <laughs> I am not aware of anything like that. The most man-made thing that we've sent out is, you know, the the Voyager missions, trying to send them out out of our solar system, and they keep going and going and going. Okay, <laughs> I, I was just wondering. Yeah. yeah. So I guess maybe maybe we can shift to uh, James Webb, which is uh, looks like it's producing all kinds of amazing images. So like, actually, before we get to James Webb, one one question that's kind of related to it. So. My understanding is James Webb sits at a Lagrange point, I guess, where you know, there's like a balance of gravitational forces, so it doesn't really move much. Do asteroids tend to accumulate and hang out at Lagrange points, or they just blow through them because they're moving so fast? Uh, they do. So you can actually get accumulation. So every, every major body has a Lagrange point, right? A Lagrange point, sorry. So we see, for example, the, the Trojans of Jupiter are, are hanging out in sort of trailing and leading Lagrange points of the Jupiter system. So we do see that actually happening. The, the particular area that JWST is in is not a pocket of asteroidal bodies. And we aren't actually sitting at the gravitational saddle point. We are in an orbit around it. It's a nice place to be because it, it, we don't have to basically burn fuel the entire time trying to stay at some distance away from Earth. Um, where we can be protected from the radiation and heat of the sun and the earth and the moon. Um, so we don't have to burn as much fuel to stay there. And we can be in a nice sort of stable orbit going around the sun with the earth. But it's, uh, there is dust out there. We do have micrometeoroids. Uh, we have other debris. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's a pretty clean environment, all things considered, especially compared to low earth orbit or anything near I mean, would, the, the asteroids reside. I mean, if there's any asteroids that are sitting at Lagrange points, I would guess that they'd be slower moving. And again, maybe there's less debris around them. So maybe you'll be, if, if you could get to them, maneuver or whatever in space to get close to them, could you study them in these oh, Lagrange yeah, yeah. points? So, be so more we're, amenable to study? we're doing this with the Lucy mission. It's going to the, to the Jupiter Trojan asteroids. Um, and so 
we're we're sort of taking advantage of there being a cluster of objects that are sort of in a nice stable area around Jupiter. So I think that's exactly what you're asking. Um, so we do we do and are doing these things. <laughs> oh great, okay, very good. Why is it quote unquote better than Hubble or different? What's what's different and or better about it? I don't know that I would call it better. I mean, I, I would call it better because I work on it. So obviously it's better, <laughs> but it's very different. And I think that's where we have to start. So Hubble is uh, operates at, at UV visible and the near infrared wavelengths. So it, it mostly sees the light that we can see with our own eyes. Um, but then it extends into the ultraviolet and it also extends a little bit um, redder than the reddest that we can see. So into the near infrared. Whereas the James Webb Space Telescope is an infrared observatory. So it operates at wavelengths that actually overlap Hubble just a little bit. So the very red red colors that you can actually see with your eyes um, all the way into the mid-infrared, so more thermal wavelengths. So that is the number one difference. It's an infrared telescope. And it was actually built and designed so that it had sort of an angular resolution or pixel scale that was comparable, or field of view that was comparable to the Hubble Space Telescope. So because it's an infrared telescope that operates at longer wavelengths, that means we had to have a bigger telescope to achieve the same sort of resolution. Um, we've been very fortunate with, with JWST, though, and it's actually performing better than we had expected. So the clarity and the resolution that we're getting with our imaging surpasses what we even had expected before we launched the telescope. And it is, it is absolutely astonishing how well it is performing and the clarity and precision of the images that we're able to obtain. So, so is, it, um, is it a good complement to Hubble? Like the same things that Hubble has imaged now is the James Webb also imaging? Yes, Because you're absolutely. getting like adjacent, adjacent um, electromagnetic spectrum results, you can see more on a particular object or area, right? Yes, abs absolutely. That's that's 100% a, a perfect way to think of it. It We are very complementary to Hubble, as well as other observatories, Chandra, or even ground-based telescopes. JWST ha operates at wavelengths that we don't have access to from the ground for the most part, but we do overlap with some of the infrared telescopes that we can observe from the ground. And so, but there are bands of the atmosphere, Earth's atmosphere, that actually absorb in infrared wavelengths. So you can't actually measure certain wavelengths of infrared radiation from the ground. Part of that is in the near infrared spectrum, and it's mostly where carbon dioxide, for example, is absorbing all the, the radiation in the Earth's atmosphere. Um, but then as you go to longer and longer wavelengths, that just becomes more and more opaque um, from the ground of, you know, here on Earth. So having an infrared telescope gives us access to those wavelengths that the Earth's atmosphere is absorbing, which is actually perfect if you want to study planets around other stars and see if any of them have an atmosphere that looks like Earth. You can't look for components of Earth's atmosphere if you're in Earth's atmosphere. <laughs> so you have to actually get beyond it to see water, carbon dioxide, um, carbon monoxide, other other key ingredients that we're looking for in these planets. So, um, and then as we get to longer and longer wavelengths, you're getting access to more of the thermal radiation that we can now observe across the universe. So you can think about these tiny little, you know, warm glowing galaxies from the very early universe that we're trying to, you know, peer at and study with the with the sensitivity of the James Webb Space Telescope. So, what would be? Um, I'm sure everyone wants a piece of the James Webb, and it's probably booked out for like you know to the end of its useful life with stuff to look at. Um, what are some of the things that you think James Webb could reveal the most about? Are they going to be like objects that are very close to it, where it could really see a tremendous amount, or is it going to be objects that are again uh, super far away, like? You know, if you if you were able to decide what James Webb would look at, what would it look at and why, in your opinion? <laughs> okay, well, um, I'm going to take one little step back before I answer that specific question. We actually only have science planned and scheduled for one year at a time for the observatory. And it's competed every single year by the entire astronomy and planetary science communities. 
So the call for proposals actually just came out um, this week. So we are now soliciting new science to come in for the next for the second year of science with the James Webb Space Telescope. And we do that to keep things fresh. There's new discoveries, there's new things that we will learn from JWST from one year to the next. And we can refine and do better each year by learning, having those lessons learned and applying them and doing new science. So that, that's a nice refresh that we get every single year with what science is going to be done with the, with the telescope. Now, as far as what it's capable of doing, it was designed to study the far, far away, right? So we are, we are setting out to try to find the first galaxies of the universe. And that is why we have an infrared telescope. That is why we have an extremely sensitive telescope. And that's why we have a very large telescope. We need to collect all the, the photons that we possibly can from the distant universe. And as that light is being stretched away from each other as the universe is expanding, so each galaxy is moving uh, away from one another, um, it's actually stretching light to longer and longer wavelengths. And that's why we're at infrared radiation as opposed to visible light. But JWST is also studying things that are a lot closer. So we're looking at not only objects in our own solar system, including the closest of the closest, like near Earth objects, but we're also studying planets around other stars. And those are all within our galaxy. So trying to understand what all the planets that we possibly can, can look at with the James Webb Space Telescope and study what their atmospheres are made of, if they have atmospheres, what their orbits look like, and if any of them have something unique going on in those atmospheres. So we do really well. We do very well at the far, far away. We do very well at the extremely close up. Um, I think you're right. Things that are bigger and we can get that we are closer to, we're getting a lot of resolution and insight into the nitty gritty details of these objects, like giant star forming regions, for example. But we have this sensitivity that we're now seeing galaxies in almost every every direction we point the telescope. There's galaxies pho photobombing all of our images, and it's absolutely fantastic. Is there any point in uh, looking back at the Earth with James Webb, or it wouldn't reveal anything extra? <laughs> we absolutely cannot point the telescope towards the Earth, the Moon, or the inner solar system. Because we're the design of the James Webb Space Telescope. So it almost looks like a, a sailboat, right? It has this huge sun shield, and then the observatory sort of pokes out of the, the center of the sun shield. Spacecraft side and the opposite side of the, the telescope itself always faces the sun and the Earth so that we keep the telescope itself, the mirror and the science instruments, extremely cold just by sitting in the shade of that sun shield. Um, oh, okay. We need that for the sensitivity of this infrared telescope. So if it looked back towards the towards anywhere near the sun, it would burn up all the objects. Yeah, it would it would annihilate our instrumentation. <laughs> all right, well, horrible idea, but at least uh, we know the worst thing you can do. Does it look out along the plane of our solar system, or does it look like quote unquote up or down out of the plane? Like where is it? Where does it tend to look, and why? Um, it can look at any any space in, in our sky at least twice a year. So it's in an orbit around L2. And so what you have to imagine, like I said, is it's, it's like a boat, a sailboat, where the sail is the actual telescope, the mirror, the giant gold mirror. So the boat part or the sunshade always faces the Earth and the sun. But you can imagine we can turn it at any direction. So you sort of get an annulus of the sky at any given time because you can pivot around the boat <laughs> or you know make the boat turn around. You just can't point it towards the sun. And so we get a, a nice ring of the sky and that, that includes everything from the plane of the solar system to you know the extreme northern and southern regions of, of our sky. So it's, it's, a, it's a pretty amazing capability. We do have some limitations, obviously. So if I want to study a comet coming into the inner solar system on, in its orbit, I have to catch that comet with JWST in a, such that it's on its path coming in, but I can't necessarily look at it when it's closest to the sun, of course. 
Okay. But th those are things we're used to dealing with in general with, with astronomy and planetary science in general. <laughs> Yeah, well, what, um, out of out of what James Webb has seen so far, what are some of the most amazing implications that that have been discovered? Uh, there's so many. Um, every every day, there's something new, and it's exciting. And I, it's hard to keep up. Actually, um, things are moving so fast, and there's so much data at any given moment. We are, but some of my favorite things um, that we've been able to see so far with the the capability of James, James Webb Space Telescope is the beautiful star forming regions in our galaxy. So looking in the Carina Nebula as one of the images that was first released, we can see the 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 intricate balance of you know new stars being formed and destroying everything around them because they're so hot and bright. Um, compared to those that are trying to, you know, the cocoons of new stars or protostars embedded within the cloud itself of gas and dust, trying to collect its own mass and build up its own star. So how that interplay of, of the material being destroyed from the new stars already formed and those that want to be um, is something that we've really not had a whole lot of insight into before. Looking in our own solar system, We've already been blown away with how easy it is to see rings around planets in our solar system. Even our commissioning data of Jupiter, we were already seeing the rings with, with less than a minute integration. So it they're so bright at these wavelengths and so accessible. The image of Neptune just blew everybody away with how radiant the rings of Neptune are at the near infrared wavelengths of J, JWST. It is um, astonishing how capable and the new things that are being revealed, even this close to home, even in our own solar system. And it's so exciting to think of the discoveries that we're making every single day. And we're just barely scratching the surface. We've, we've only been doing science for a few months, and we're already breaking the records of, you know, the most distance, distant objects that we've been able to observe to date, new discoveries in our solar system, following up on, on things that we've only predicted and, and, and understood in, in theoretical ways uh, and trying to make the new discoveries, and who knows what's going to happen on the horizon. Are there um, mainstream science interpreters of the results of James Webb as they come out? Or do you have to go to the individual scientists that you know, have observed X, Y, or Z and go to them for conclusions? Um, my advice is to always go to the scientist. If they planned the observation, if they pointed the telescope in a certain way with a certain instrument, they have some science objective in mind, some goal for what they're trying to study or learn or understand. That being said, other scientists are going to be looking at these data and learning other things that maybe the, the primary scientist didn't want or wasn't planning to do. And so there will be years and years of people digging through these data, even the very first images, um, just trying to understand them more and more. Because every time you look, there's so much data that it's hard and it's overwhelming to try to comprehend everything that's contained in each image that we receive or each spectrum that we receive. So I think we have beyond decades worth of data in hand and hopefully feed all of the graduate students in the next couple of decades <laughs> their, their thesis work because it's absolutely mind-blowing how much information there are in each one of these images. Um, when you do the yearly approval, do you publicly disseminate what the James Webb schedule is for the next year? And the reason I ask is like, um, you know, if I'm a scientist that wants to study a certain part of the universe, and I didn't get approved, but someone else did, but I see I could kind of piggyback on what they're going to observe, you know, I may want to contact them and say, hey, can we partner up somehow? So does that happen when you release the schedule, or do you not release it for certain reasons? <laughs> it is released. So all of the programs that are approved are made public, um, as well as the when they are scheduled. Um, so the, it starts with we look at when they can be observed with the James Webb Space Telescope. So as I said, you know, we're in this orbit around the sun and we have access to the sky a couple of times a year. So if it's not in an area that we can see year round, you get windows of 
when you can actually observe your target. And so that's the first phase. Then, you know, we have a algorithms as well as a whole crew of, of people that work through how to put things into the schedule in a, in a nice systematic way so that we're being efficient with the observatory. So think of it as we don't want to look in the north part of the sky for one observation for, let's say, an hour, two hours, and then point the telescope all the way down to the south side of the sky to, to observe for another hour and then go back up to the north. We're trying not to use fuel um, so that we have a longer mission lifetime and we don't have as much dead time to slewing the telescope. So we're trying to schedule things to stack in a nice, in a nice manner so that we're, we're being efficient with the observatory and using as much of the time as we possibly can for science. Okay. So once the schedule is done, though, um, you, there's a, a long-range schedule, so sort of penciled in where we think things are going to fall over the, the course of the year. But then there's also the short-term schedule, which is where things are kind of finalized. And if there's, you know, some transient event that needs to be squeezed in, they have to go in and work how to do that. But at any rate, it is public information, and you can determine what's being observed and when. Now, okay. Okay. scientists are allowed to hold on to their data privately and to work on their data for a whole year of time if they want to. And if they choose to do that, then the public or anybody else will not have access to their data. They'll know that it's been acquired, but they won't be able to access it. But after that first year, all data become public, and anybody in the world can access these data. Oh, okay, interesting. Yeah, it's interesting the dynamics of this whole thing. Just, just a couple more questions. Um, what observations that the James Webb has made that you particularly thought were amazing or cool? You know, any implications of them? So everything that we've observed to date has been amazing and cool and blown me away. I don't know why I'm not an extragalactic scientist after seeing, you know, Stefan's Quintet. That picture, that first image that was released just blew me away with the, the beauty and the questions that emerge from just looking at these fantastic galaxies as they're colliding with one another. I have no idea what that science is. I just think it's fantastic and it's so intriguing to me. My favorite things that have been observed to date are probably the comets that we've observed so far. I'm involved in almost all of the comet programs, and we're getting exciting data. And it's, it's amazing to see the capability of, of what we can do with this observatory that we've never been able to do with any other telescope. We are observing the, the satellites of Jupiter and Saturn, um, including some of our favorites like Titan, Europa, Enceladus. IO, these are all observed now, and it's really exciting to think of what's coming out of these data. Just looking at the first images of Jupiter and its system, we already know that there's things that they're learning and studying in, in beautiful detail. And I don't know, I, I don't have an answer for what my favorite is or what the most compelling is, because I think it's absolutely astonishing and mind-blowing. And I I have no idea how any one group of people that are taking these data can process all of this information and try to, to come up with a good story because there's so much information um, embedded in every single one of these observations that it, it's just exciting and thrilling, and I can't wait for the, the science results to start spilling out. Okay. Um, where, where do you consider the best place to get uh, James Webb data? Images? interpretations, all that stuff. So the I would go to the, the NASA or Space Telescope Science Institute press releases on the James Webb Space Telescope. If you jwst.nasa.gov, you'll see a whole highlight of news articles and features that have been released. A lot of those are, are our new images with descriptions of what those images are. But there's also other stories. There's We have a blog that we are also releasing some of these first look images with stories from the science team um, telling why they did these observations or how and what their first look or first glimpse of these data are telling them. So there's all kinds of information already out there. Just Google JWST, and I, I'm sure you will find any and everything you could possibly imagine. Okay, excellent. Well, Stephanie, um, any other resources for people or jwst.nasa.gov is the best or any other that's, recommendations? That's my go-to. and. If, if anything, it'll point you in the right direction of where to find more. 
Excellent. Well, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. And it was great. I feel like we could talk a lot longer, but you know, can't hold you here forever. But thank you so much for all the info. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.